welcome to Getting APIs to Work. In today's episode, we'll talk about what is an API and we'll look at it from the perspective of how it works and how it comes into being. And I think that is a particularly interesting perspective to talk about. I have had two previous attempts to explain what is an API and I think they were both valid. So one was saying an API has to be network and reusable. And I think that's still the case, but it's a rather technically focused aspect to look at APIs. The second one said an API is a product. An API is an interface to something that you want to make available. And it's important to think about what you're making available. And then the API is just the way how people can interact with it in a certain way, in a machine understandable way. And I think that's true as well, but that doesn't tell you much about how an API works and how it comes into being. So today we'll look at that. And I want to look at it from the perspective of an API as a language. I, that's really my favorite description of what an API is. It is a language. How does that language work and how does it come into being? Let's look at a very simple example. Let's look at a weather service. Now a weather service starts with weather and somebody putting in the effort of collecting weather data, writing code that looks at the weather data and makes predictions. At some point, they might decide to put an API in front of their weather service, making it available for others to access over the network. And then the typical scenario would look like this. Somebody writes a weather app, let's say on a phone, and that weather app can access the weather service to retrieve, let's say the weather forecast, and then the response will contain the weather forecast for some location and somebody can look at it. So the phone has to talk to the weather service. So that's the language that I'm referring to. It's the way how this conversation of, can you please tell me what the weather forecast is for this location? And then the service saying, okay, here it is. And then the phone has to create a graphic representation of it so that it's nice to look at for a human user, but the main input for that will be the data that the weather forecast service produces. This perspective is correct and it explains how an API works, but it doesn't explain how an API comes into being and what is important to keep in mind when you create APIs. For this, let's take a step back and once again, just look at the weather forecast service. Now, if somebody decides that this weather forecast service should be made available to others, then the first exercise you have to go through is a basic design exercise of thinking about what kind of weather forecasts do I want to make available? There are many different ways how you can design a weather forecast. You can just say, what's the current weather? What's the weather for the rest of the day? What's a three day weather forecast, seven day weather forecast, show me maps of precipitation, show me this or that. So there are many, many different ways how you can design a weather forecast service. And that's a question of what you have available and what you want to expose to others. That's a design exercise that a human team, a human person will go through and say, this is what we want our weather forecast service to do. So you design that product of a weather forecast service, you design the API for it, which is a technical design exercise. And then somebody goes forward and implements it. So they implement the code that is able to speak that language, to speak the language of here is how our weather forecast service works. So at that point, you have a service that exists that can respond to requests for the weather forecast, but nobody uses it. What now? The next step is that the team providing the weather forecast service will publish their API description. They will document how their weather API works and they will make this description available so that others can consume it. 
Very often this might happen on the web, so this becomes something that you can find if you Google for it, and we'll look at that in a little while. First, let's look at the general process in a little bit more detail. Once you've published it, now somebody can go ahead and discover it. So they might find it through Google or somebody might send them a link and say, hey, look, here's a cool weather forecast service. Why don't we use that one? Now that you've discovered it and you understand that there is a weather forecast service out there that you might want to use because of its features or because somebody told you it's really accurate, you should use that one. Now you can go forward and read the documentation. At this point, the developer team that wants to develop a weather app learns about how the weather forecast service makes their forecast data available. So they understand the language that the weather forecast service has implemented and they have to implement the other side of that language. So they go forward and implement the weather forecast service consumer side in, let's say, the app that they want to create so that people can use the weather forecast service. At this point, what has happened, and that's really important to understand, is that initially what had to be done is that the team that created the weather forecast service had to communicate to the team that wants to consume the weather forecast service how that service works. But they never had to talk to each other. And that is one of the really important parts of APIs that because you can document them and it's hopefully a well-designed language, you can document them in a way that somebody just reads the documentation and they understand how it works. And we will look at that, like I said, in just, just a little while. Now that those two teams have understood each other, they can create matching implementations and we can have the same picture that we had before where the phone sends a request to the weather forecast service and the weather forecast service sends a response and then the phone will take that data and format it into some nice display and the users can happily use the weather forecast service. One important thing to understand here is that if we look at this complete picture, what we see is a picture that is scaling very well. What do I mean by this? What I mean is that if this weather forecast service becomes really popular and you have thousands or tens of thousands of developers who want to develop applications that use the weather forecast service, they can do it. They don't have to talk to these thousands or tens of thousands of developers because those developers will just read the documentation. So as long as the documentation is good enough that people understand how the weather forecast service works, they can scale to many, many, many different users, which makes this API model so appealing because it allows providers of services and consumers of services to collaborate in a more loosely coupled way. And that is really valuable in particular when you look at applications where scale and a certain level of independent development is really important. And more and more, that's really what people are looking for because we have many cases where if those teams would need to communicate and sit down together and then really work through it, that might not happen for a long time because of synchronization problems and all other kinds of problems that can slow down such a process. The really important takeaway here is that what happens here is that the language that the API represents, the language is designed by humans, the language is meant to be understood by humans, and then it's just used by machines. That is really important to understand. And if you always keep that in mind, that an API in the end is meant for developers, so that the developers can program the machines to use it. If you always keep that in mind, you will have a much better way of understanding where API investments really matter and where to look at when you try to understand what happens in many API scenarios. Now let's go and look at the example that I was using for one concrete case. What I'm showing you here is a 
weather forecast service. I picked this one because they had a very simple process how I could use their API. I don't have any particular preference for this specific service. So this is the homepage of the weather forecast service. They have a place where they talk about their APIs and this is exactly what I showed you before. This is where they publish the description of how their APIs work. So I can go there and this is what I did for this video. I can go there and I can read the documentation for this specific API, which is the current weather data API, and I can understand how it works. This here describes the language of the API. It's a documentation that describes the API, how it works, how the language works. So for example, I can understand that if I want to request the information about the current weather in a city, this is how I can do it. And because it's an HTTP API, that means I can actually try it out in my browser, which is pretty cool because I can show you how it works. What we need to do is for this language to work, we have to fill in those two parts. So we need to know the city name and we need to have an API key. I already got the API key so I have that. And in order for the city name to work, I have to find out these city codes. And that is a way what the developers of the API decided to do. So in order for me to use this API, I have to go through a long list of city names and find the city that I'm looking for. And I did this and I entered it here. So up here you can see that I already entered the city ID. In this case, this is the code for Zurich. I had to learn this because this is part of the language design. I learned this by going through a big spreadsheet basically of cities and IDs. So now I can retrieve the weather forecast for Zurich. What I get back is actually this, it's raw data. And as you can see, there's stuff in there like sunrise, sunset and all these kind of things. And to make it a little easier to read, I can have this formatted display of the same data. So what you see here is JSON. It's the preferred content format for APIs so f in, in the, uh, at the moment. So this is how API languages typically work. They structure data in JSON and then that data is being sent back and forth. So what you see here, and we won't go through any of the details, what you see here is that I get this weather data for Zurich and it says few clouds and I'm looking out of the window and I have to say that that's true. There are only few clouds out there. One last little thing I want to show you is that because this API is designed to be used worldwide, I can also ask to get all the human readable data in a different way. So I can say, send me your response in German. And now instead of saying few clouds, it says ein paar Wolken, which means the same just in German. So as you can see, this API is designed that it can be easily consumed by people using different languages, which makes it more useful, which means it scales better. And that is really what you want with this kind of API. And this is really all that I wanted to talk about and show you today. So talk a little bit about what an API is. It's a language. Talk a little bit about where this language comes from. It's designed by developers and designed to be consumed by developers, at least to be understood by developers. And then show you this one example of a language in that case for a very simple API. Many APIs out there in the wild will be a little bit more complicated. So let's say for a product ordering API, instead of just asking about something, that API will have things such as asking about, is a product available? Then you can order the product, then you can check the order status, then you can pay for the product, then maybe you can order the delivery, you can check the delivery status. So this process might be quite a bit more complicated but in essence, it will be the same. It will be a language how this information can be exchanged between the ordering service and the app doing the ordering. And that language then allows those two parties to interact. And again, it will be a language that has been designed by somebody who sat down, designed that API, documented it, and then anybody who wants to write an application 
that orders things can read the documentation and use it. And this really is the essence of APIs that the API is, and this goes back to my point from the very beginning, an API is reusable because you have designed a language that can be understood and used by many. And that makes it so useful because you don't have to come up with a new solution for every individual partner that you want to interact with. That's all that I have for today. I hope you found that useful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions or comments, please leave a comment down in the comment section. And other than that, that was it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you'll be back for more content and um, have a great day. Bye.